In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, amen. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus makes sure that we don't lose sight of who God is. He does it by showing us God. He was transfigured before them, Mark says. Jesus cuts through all the notions, all the ideas, all the thoughts we think we think, and he gets right down to it and said, this is God and no other. So does the Father. He envelops these terrified apostles in this cloud of his, and he puts an end to any debates, any disputes. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God has spoken. The cause is finished. Here endeth the lesson. But why, we ask? Why? Why Why this weird event on the mountain? Why this glory? Why the ghosts of Moses and Elijah? Why the cloud? Why the voice? And our knee-jerk answer, and it isn't wrong, is that Jesus is preparing the path for the Lenten journey. He's about to be stricken, smitten, and afflicted, killed to death. So he reminds us who he is. Whiter than white, more dazzling than dazzling, bleached. He is the white, the good, the God. Yet on both sides of this story in Mark's gospel, we find misunderstandings. We hear Peter, ever talking Peter, whose terror couldn't even keep his mouth shut, suggest to Jesus that the path of the cross is not the right path. In the week leading up to the transfiguration, Jesus has begun laying before his apostles the truth about death and resurrection, his death, his resurrection. And Peter hears all this and says, no, this shall not be. Take it back, Jesus. And this forces Jesus to use the strongest card he has in his hand. Get behind me, Satan. Peter, terrified, doesn't understand what he's saying, just like he did up on the mountain. So Jesus tells him what to think. Jesus tells him what to say. You don't tell me what to do, Peter. I tell you. We're going and you're following. I'm bearing a cross and you're going to bear one too. I'm losing my life for you. You're going to lose your life for me. This world will try to forfeit your soul. And if you're ashamed of this, if you're ashamed of me, then I will be ashamed of you before the Father, Peter. Later, after Jesus has put back his glory for a moment, he has to deal with his disciples' inability to cast out a demon from a young man. He comes down and sees the apostles who failed. They failed because they didn't pray. And so now he looks at this crowd, this crowd that's looking at him, some of them incredulously, unbelieving that some of Jesus' helpers can't help, which means God can't help. And so Jesus looks at this crowd and says, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? And in between those two things, he was transfigured before them. Not all of them, just Peter, James, and John got to see this. He metamorphosed. He changed. He transformed. Jesus gave them both barrels of the really real. Jesus as he is. Reading Mark here makes me think of a a piece of art from the era of the Reformation. It's an altarpiece from a place called Eisenheim that was painted by the artist Matthias Grunwald. It's printed on the the cover of your worship folder this morning. The the portion of this altarpiece that I'm thinking of isn't even about the transfiguration, though. It's a picture of the resurrection. You look at this picture and you see a stark black background. You see the soldiers all falling to the ground, their bodies akimbo, fainting because of the majesty and the might and the power that they're seeing. And then, then, then you see the Lord. You see the resurrected Lord emerging from his tomb with his wounds, with his life. You've seen a lot of images of the resurrection, I dare say, but, but I don't think you've ever seen one quite like this. It's a striking image because it comes off as all sci-fi and cosmic and ghostly and ghastly all at the same time, because what Grunwald does is he surrounds Jesus, his upper body, in this this ball of light, this fireball, this yellow-orange sun, and it makes Jesus seem more ethereal than we could ever imagine, whiter than white, dazzling, blazing, bleached, and yet for all that, not less real. 
You can't look away. He is the light in the darkness, the light no darkness can overcome. One art critic looked at this painting and says, here Grunwald transfigures the countenance of the crucified into the face of God. Grunwald does just that. Elsewhere on the same altarpiece, there are a variety of portraits he painted for it. Grunwald gives us the crucifixion of our Lord, and what a juxtaposition. What a contrast. There, it's Jesus all akimbo. The nails twist his hands and his feet out of all natural course. His head lulls at a disturbing angle. The women weep and mourn and pray. The Apostle John can't even look at this jaundiced figure, but John the Baptist can. Just as at the transfiguration, someone comes from the grave to speak at this moment in Jesus' life, and it's John the Baptist. John the Baptist telling us who Jesus is, and it's the Lamb at John's feet that give us the words, Look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus talks to us about losing our life for him. And here he shows us who we're losing it for. He asked if he'd rather gain the whole world and forfeit this. He asks, how could you be embarrassed of this? What is this? Jesus becomes the white we need him to be. Jesus becomes the white we pray he can be. Jesus becomes the white that God gives us. But first, first he must become the blackest of the black, stained and bloodied and gory, a sacred head wounded, bleeding, dying, dead. Because of me. Because of my sins. We agonize over this to deal with this. I read an article this week where a church historian named Martin Marty talked about two different kinds of spirituality. He talked about summery spirituality and wintry spirituality. Summery spirituality is all Skittles and beer. Summery spirituality is breezy and bubbly and it focuses on the power of positive thinking. Summary spirituality says all is well and all will be well and I just have to think it and convince myself of it and therefore convince God. This summary view sees all things through rose-colored glasses. God loves you and I love you and we all love each other and we all get together and sing kumbaya and in its worst form it comes to us in these prosperity gospelers, these preachers who tell you that God wants you to have your best life now and he will give you your best life now if you just believe hard enough. This summary spirituality is all good friends and warm breezes and cold beer and it can conceive of nothing else and sees everything else as not adequately God. But then there's wintry spirituality. And we know about winter, right? It blows. It's cold. It's frigid. It's fierce. It's unyielding. It's unfair. You can die in this kind of weather. You can die 50, 100 feet from your house or your car if the conditions are right. So it's a struggle. And we bear down against it. We bundle up. We close our eyes. We lean into it. We slog on. We fight. Which one sounds more like your life? I rejoice with you in all of your blessings, all of your good fortune, and I pray you rejoice with me in mine. And at the same time, I know about pain and suffering and loss and anguish. I know about lost control. I know about awakening and reawakening pain. I know about death, death coming ever closer, death stalking indiscriminately. I know of sending someone home from the hospital with God's blessings only to be back there momentarily again. Yes, in Christ we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we know the words of God and we believe the words of God that God works out all things for the good of those who love him. We know it, we believe it, but we can't always see it, grasp it, understand it. And on top of that, these promises of God that we know and love and cherish do not vacate the words that the Apostle Paul says immediately thereafter. Those words where he talks about trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness, and danger, and sword. 
Which one sounds more like God? We read about Job last week. We heard some of his words. Job, who has to deal with God. You know Job's laments, his aches, his pains. Next week, we'll climb up Mount Moriah with Abraham as he takes his son Isaac on a trip, a trip that will end with him binding his son, placing him on an an altar, and raising his knife to sacrifice his son. Not because Abraham is a nut and a maniac and a murderer, but because God commanded it. God commands this? What about Mount Sinai? The fire and the smoke and the words of God on Mount Sinai, the fire and the smoke and the words of God that so terrify the people of Israel that they come to Moses and say, you talk to us for God because his words will kill us. And then, of course, you have Calvary, the last of the mountains. And there you have the twisted hands and the twisted feet. You have the crown of thorns, you have the bloodied back, you have the pierced side, and you have the death, the commanded and demanded death of God's Son, His Son, His only Son, His Isaac, a dark and doleful day. Looking into the eyes of the Father on that day must have been a terrifying thing because it is to look into the eyes of him whose will it was to crush his son, to cause him to suffer. A wintry blast for sure. O sorrow dread, God is dead. And yet he lives. That's exactly the content of the conversation Jesus had with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. They spoke about death and life. They spoke about dying and living. Jesus' death and life. Jesus dying and living. What Luke tells us in his account, Jesus describes as his exodus. And so now we can put those two images of Grunwald side by side. On the one hand, we see the gruesome, terrifying, gory death of Christ our Lord. And on the other we see death's curse transfigured into cosmic glory. Earth-shattering, tomb-rattling glory, resurrection glory in a flash, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he goes from being just Jesus to the resurrected Lord. And it's the very gift that he gives us as he promises us that the winter of our discontent becomes the summer of everlasting life in Christ. And these are the very gifts we taste and touch and hold on to and receive in his word and sacrament. These are the places where God gives the thing that our heart needs, that our heart craves, that our heart desires the most, the forgiveness of sins. Where God announces his grace upon you, where God gives you his righteousness, pours it upon you as a piece of clothing, where he gives you life after death, where he gives you resurrection and transfiguration. This is the preaching we listen to at God's command. That God's Son, His only Son, His beloved Son, His chosen Son, came into an exodus out of this world in the most gruesome and gory of manners. And yet He remains, as the apostles realized when they finally were able to open their eyes on the mountain, He remains, as always, just Jesus. With us, as always, Jesus talking about the resurrection, Jesus, his resurrection, and then ours. Resurrection, of course, requires death, and so God obliges. He takes up all, us up all these mountains, up Mount Moriah, up Mount Sinai, up Mount Calvary, and he ties us to the altar, and he lifts the blade to give us the punishment that our sins deserve, death, and then the Lamb appears. The Lamb with His blood pouring out, the Lamb pouring out His blood for us, the Lamb who stops His Father's hand so that He can say, Ego te absolvo, I forgive you. The Lamb who proceeds to show us God as He is, the Lamb who changes everything we think and feel, every notion and idea, everything we think we think about God, and at the bottom of it, it's whiter than white. And him, 
clothing us in his own white robe, washing that robe to its whitest shine, bleached beyond the light of the sun, brighter than all the light in all the world with his own blood, and declaring it to be so, declaring it to be true by the glory that is his, by the power and authority that the Father says he possesses. This is my son. I love him. Listen to him. And by that very authority, Jesus speaks us forgiven. By that authority, he baptizes us sons. By that authority, Jesus says that this food, this bread and wine, nourishes you with my body and blood, he says, until you follow me into glory. Until I transfigure and transform and change you. In a flash. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the resurrection of the body. Your resurrection, your body, your transfiguration in Christ. Amen.